you Satish Kumar for accepting this invitation for this interview today to discuss all the amazing experience that you had in life and that you're probably going to share with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So you have, you started at eight years old, I read, walking mm -hmm. with your mother in India and that was your first walk, your first official pilgrimage in India. And since then, you have uh, actually walked 8,000 miles as a, it, uh, you, you've done a peace walk. What was the purpose of this? What is for you the, what does a pilgrimage bring in our life? What was your intention with, with, with doing this peace walk? First of all, first of all, the difference between a tourist and a pilgrim is that tourist is interested in himself or herself. We, when we go to a place, we want to get best out of that place for ourselves. Whereas when the, you are a pilgrim, you are interested in the place, in the people, in the country where you are. And you are in a way for the benefit of that place. And you have a respect for that place and you see that place as a sacred place. So this is the difference between being a tourist and being a pilgrim. Wherever and you I go. See, wherever we go, wherever we are in the world, it is a state of mind. It is a state of attitude. When you live like a pilgrim in your life, your life becomes a pilgrimage. And wherever you are, you, are, you put a very small footprint a very light weight and a light impact on the earth because you respect the earth, you respect people, you respect cultures and that way you are a pilgrim for all your life, in all your life. That is the difference. So when I went and my biggest pilgrimage was from India to Europe and then to America and that was in 1962. Huh. If you remember, there was a great movement for peace uh, against nuclear weapons. Uh -huh. And at that time in England, a great philosopher, mathematician, Nobel Prize winning uh, mathematician, Bertrand Russell, he was protesting against the nuclear weapons and was put in jail. And when he was put in jail at age 90, I felt so strongly about it that here is a man of 90 going to jail for peace in the world. What am I doing, young man, sitting here drinking coffee? And that was the moment when I decided to take this pilgrimage from India to, um, to Moscow, to Paris, to London and to Washington DC, the four nuclear capitals of that time. And I did it um, from 1962 to 1964, 65, and 8,000 miles of walking without any money. That was the biggest pilgrimage. Mm. But, you, but this adventure already started for you at the age of eight years old. I read when you started with your mother, and then you were a monk, and then at 1918, you read Gandhi, and Gandhi was actually a man... I mean, is this something from your own culture, from India? Tell me about that, how you were raised over there. What does, how do you have the courage to, in the opposite of us in this society, you know, to let everything go and just go for this, this cause? I mean, yeah. what is that? Where is that so, coming from? Until that big pilgrimage from India to America, the, the, the uh, life before that pilgrimage, was a kind of preparation okay. as a kind without planning without knowing without thinking that was a preparation and that preparation started when i was a very young child and when i was with my mother my mother was my greatest teacher to be a pilgrim because she was a pilgrim she always respected the earth respected people and did not want anything for herself she wanted always to give herself for the well-being of the earth, well-being of animals, well-being of trees, well-being of land, and well-being of people. 
And so I learned that attitude from my mother. And when uh, I was four years old and five years old, I will go with my mother to our farm. We had a five acre small farm and my mother was very interested in nature. So we'll walk every day. And if somebody said, why don't you go on a horseback or a camelback? Uh, then my mother would say, how would you like if the horse wanted to climb and ride on you? If camel wanted to ride on you? Mm -hmm. So respect for animals, respect for horses and camels. She did not ride on them. We always walked. And when we walked, that was a pilgrimage to our farm. And on the way, she would teach me about nature, about interrelatedness, about uh, all living beings are related, all beings are connected. We depend on the trees, trees depend on soil, soil depends on the rain, uh, fruit depends on the sunshine. Everything is connected, all are related. That was the teaching of my mother. And that was the beginning to be a pilgrim from age four, five. Mm, until now, clearly. And, and you, so it's a state of mind, it's a philosophy, that's why you wrote a book that is going to come out in October, mid-October, about the Earth Pilgrim. So for you, life is actually being, having the state of mind of a pilgrim is, is to be in the now and in the here? That's right. Now I have written this book called Earth Pilgrim, yeah. where I want to express this idea that if we human beings live on this earth as pilgrims, then we can take care of this earth and this earth will be there forever and humanity will be there forever. It will be sustainable, it will be resilient and it will be durable. But if we don't live like pilgrim, but if we live like tourists, then we'll consume, consume, consume and very soon we will deplete the resources of the earth. This is what we are doing at the moment. We are not being upon this earth like a guest. The earth is a very gracious host, but we are not very gracious guests. So in my book, I'm trying to say that if we want a sustainable future, we want to mitigate the problems like climate change and global warming and resource depletion and peak oil, then we have to change our mindset. We have to change our attitude. We have to change our way of thinking and being. And we have to be pilgrims on this earth and guests of this earth and not exploiters and abusers of this earth. So that is the theme of my book. Mm, that's definitely a message that is needed right now. And I hear your passion for really make, waking us up. We need to wake up, don't we? Absolutely. Because at this moment, uh, we are facing so many problems of uh, social and ecological, environmental and spiritual. Yeah. So we, as a pilgrim, we can also renew our spiritual well-being as well as our social well-being because I say that there are three important things we need to remember. Soil, soul and society. The soil is our primary source of life. So if we do not respect the soil, because that is the real wealth, money is not wealth. Money is only a measure of wealth. The real wealth is the earth, the land, the forest, the trees, um, the rivers, uh, the animals. That is the real wealth. And what we are doing, we are turning and changing and destroying our rainforest and we are killing animals and we are poisoning the land and we are damming the rivers to make money. So we are exchanging real wealth with a kind of artificial wealth. So I am trying to say that let us protect the real capital, the nature capital, the real wealth, which is nature wealth. If we can protect that wealth, then our well-being will be secured. Mm -hmm. And then soul is the second point. We have to also take care of our soul values, like being compassionate, being kind, being generous, uh, being, um, being open-minded. These are spiritual values. And unless we have these spiritual values of truth and nonviolence and, and simplicity and, and, uh, and elegance, we will not be able to survive well and we will not be able to be happy. And, and the happiness is the birthright of every human being. So soul qualities 
are very important to protect. And the third element is society. We are a community, human community. And if our society is not living in harmony with each other and we have a social injustice and poverty and deprivation and slums and, and the rural areas are without food, without water. If that kind of humanity we live, then we will not be able to create a good future for humanity. So soil, soul and society. These are the three important words which I'm promoting through my book. And, and I clearly hear this message and it goes straight in our hearts and it feels and it rings true, unfortunately, with we have all those fears and we have this scarcity. How do you switch from, from, from the scarcity uh, mindset that we were raised here with to start to expand our mind to this, yeah, to this very noble, very humble, very spirited consciousness. How do we? How do we get there? How do we yeah. do this quantum leap? We this we question. need this quantum leap by becoming conscious, by becoming aware. We have to stop and and walk slowly, be a pilgrim, and think. When you can think properly, that we are here not just for ourselves. We are here for each other. You are, therefore, I am. We have to move from this uh, Cartesian thinking. Um, René Descartes said, cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore, I am. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to change that. Yeah. We have to now say that not I think, therefore, I am, but you are, therefore, I am. The trees are, therefore, I am. The earth is therefore I am, and the, the animals are therefore I am, the other human beings are therefore I am. We are all related and connected. This world view uh, we have to adopt, and this is a new paradigm. We have to change our paradigm of selfish thinking, individualistic thinking, and a separational thinking, that you are separate from me, the earth is separate from me, the trees and forests are separate from me. They are not separate. We are all made of the same stuff, earth, air, fire, water, space, consciousness, and, uh, and imagination, and creativity. These are the basic stuff of life, basic elements, and we are all made of all those elements. And therefore, we are one, and we are manifesting in diversity. So unity of life and diversity of manifestation, that new philosophy and new understanding has to be put in place if we want to create a sustainable, resilient, and a durable future for humanity. Apparently in India you say chi for consciousness, chi, shit? Chit, chit, yeah. So um, there are three words in Indian philosophy, sat, chit, ananda. So sat is the reality. So the reality of our existence mm -hmm. is chit. So that it means it's conscious, it's not dead reality. Reality is alive, is conscious, it's a, it's moving, a living reality, evolving. it's intelligent. Yes, it's all moving, it's evolving, it's intelligent and it's conscious. So uh, reality is conscious. And if you understand this idea of consciousness as a primary being uh, and, and a kind of potential like energy, um, the, the foundation, the basis um, the, the primary reality and then out of that consciousness um, emerges life, earth, trees, forests, sun, moon, everything. And if we can realize this unity of life, then we arrive to a place of ananda, which means joy, blissful living, happy living. Uh, the harmony and happiness go together. When we understand that reality is conscious and alive and harmonious, then we can be happy. So Ananda, for example, if you have a, a person in India changing from a lay person to a monk, then they change name. Mm -hmm. And their name is always ending with the word Ananda, like Mukta Nanda, Shiva Nanda, Yoga Nanda, Satya Nanda, mm -hmm. always Ananda. Mm -hmm. So Yoga Nanda, for example, means Yoga and Ananda. If there is no joy, there is no happiness, there is no bliss, uh, then just yoga is not enough. In the same way, truth is not enough. 
Um, uh, nothing is enough unless there is joy, there is happiness. Our society at the moment is becoming very wealthy with money. We have lots of buildings, lots of houses, lots of roads, lots of aeroplanes, lots of computers, lots of televisions, lots of gadgets and technology, but no happiness. And so this is not good enough. We have to create a system which make people fulfilled and joyful and, and satisfied and contented and happy. And so if you become an earth pilgrim and if you create a mindset of pilgrimage and your paradigm is of pilgrimage, then you are more likely to be happy living upon this earth.